people are starting to arrive. So um, hello, everybody um, who's here. Um, people coming in, great stuff. We'll just give it another minute or two. Um, I'll just do a brief intro and ask um, our lovely co-host, Amy Taylor, to do a brief intro as well before we get started proper. So my name's um, Richard Dunbar, Senior Community Organiser for Debt Justice. Um, the only charity in the UK purely dedicated to tackling and organising um, debt, um, both here in the UK, but also in the global south as well. Um, yeah, so that's me very briefly. Amy, I'll, I'll just pass over to you very briefly. Okay, um, I might. I think I've got about five minutes worth here, so please tell me to shut up when, when you've heard enough from me and I need to shut up and I can always finish at the end if need be. So, hi everybody, I am Amy Ames Taylor, debt advisor for the past 15 years and I'm the chair of Greater Manchester Money Advice Group, which is a network of not-for-profit debt advisors from Greater Manchester and beyond. So, our advisors come from Citizens Advice, local authorities, housing associations and little charities as well. As well. Uh, we try to help people who've become overwhelmed with debt because it's quite overwhelming. So I'm here tonight because I absolutely love listening to people say things. I love listening to people telling their stories because although as a debt advisor I sometimes do hear quite sad stories about abuse and heartbreak and ill health and bailiffs and evictions, I also hear stories of survival and strength and fighting back and taking control and gaining knowledge and becoming powerful. And even better than that, I sometimes see David beat Goliath and I see people getting the debts written off and I get to see people who've gone from not being able to sleep at night to rising up like Maya Angelou and walking into the new life with a big smile on their face. And that is when being a debt advisor is the best job in the world and it's a privilege. But that's not the only reason I'm here. Um, I wrote a speech with loads of stats and stuff and then I thought, well, this is about people telling their stories. So I thought, I've never done this before. I might tell a bit of mine uh, a little bit because I could yap on. So when I was a kid, we didn't have a lot of money and I'm not saying we were in poverty because I was only a kid and I didn't really know. But I do know that everybody else in my class had a blue school tie and I had a, a green Cub Scouts tie, which my mum had bought for 10p from a second hand shop down the road because you remember these things. So I looked a bit different and you know what kids are like, um, sort of merciless really. So I got picked on. I didn't have the cool clothes that, that they were wearing at the youth club, if you remember them. Um, I'd like cheap stuff. So everybody had, you know, nice 80s hair and night windbreakers and fara trousers. And I didn't. I looked different. Um, and it made me feel different. And it made me feel like I just wasn't good enough because we just didn't have enough money. So what I want people to know if they don't know already is that they don't need to be ashamed because being poor isn't a character flaw not having enough money to live on isn't a crime like say you know paying millions of pounds to your mates for dodgy ppe or inside a betting on the date of the election so that's what's driving me is is the the shame factor the stigma about being in debt, about not having enough. That's that's what I see all too often, unfortunately. Um, how am I doing for time, Richard? One and a half minutes left. Right. So this week I heard Keir Starmer say something. So he said there was no dignity in handouts and that people would rather earn money. I reckon that's all well and good if you can earn, but what if you can't? Why is social security an insurance policy that we pay into suddenly being referred to as a handout? Words matter. Um, I also heard the Veterans Minister, Johnny Mercer, say that veterans using food banks were making a choice to do so. But we know, don't we, that no one chooses a food bank. Only someone who's never actually relied on a food bank parcel would say that. Um, so 
I wish these sons of toolmakers and GPs and whatever else could listen to the people on this call directly, listen and understand what it's like to be in debt, not for overspending uh, on holidays and luxuries, but for things like gas and electric and the food and the rent and the mortgage and the school uniform. These are the basics that we all have a right to expect if we had a good government. And if that government under, could understand how bad it really gets and, and the scars it leaves behind, then they might even change things. And that's why the work that Debt Justice have been doing for the last few years is so important. And that's why tonight is, is really important. Um, we must speak out about the reality of not having enough, of being forced into debt, of living with the fear of another brown envelope and another message from the bailiff and so on. We've got to make these powerful people understand that it's no way to live. We've got to change the narrative from one of blame and shame to one of understanding and hope. And the voices we hear tonight hopefully will help make this change so thank you Emma. that's me i'm now gonna um introduce sorry <laughs> i was gonna move straight into um introducing the first of our speakers um who is dada sabeda she is a i'm gonna get this right a polyglot poet, a a a a uh, sorry. an activist a champion progression for the last 50 Yeah. So, sorry, Amy. It's just um, just a few things we missed out telling people at the outset before we introduced Dada. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, w I went right into it, didn't I? Do yeah. apologise. No, 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 no. It's absolutely fine because that was so powerful. I think your story will resonate with a lot of people, um, to be honest with you. Um, so, yeah, so I just want to welcome a few other people who turned up after Amy started speaking. So this is the... Um, um, Debt Justice, the People's Manifesto um, General Election Rally, and the real purpose of us holding this meeting, like Amy alluded to, was around giving people hope, and those people who are experiencing the harsh realities of debt on a daily basis in this country um, got to realise that there is hope, that by coming together, um, we can build up, we can build change, we can make a difference. And this uh, manifesto, which we have... Um, Bill. So this is Together Against Debt, the People's Manifesto, which we've built. And this isn't debt justice staff that have wrote this manifesto. This is people who are experiencing the harsh realities of debt on a daily basis that have wrote that manifesto. And we took a purposeful choice not to invite politicians to speak to this event tonight because we wanted to give the space to people who directly experience that because we believe those are the best people to come up with the solutions and like amy um i've experienced that myself very recently before i got this job i'm a solo parent i struggled um to pay my mortgage i'm still paying my debts back from from that time um you know so things are difficult for people um all around and just to talk about the scale of the problem 10 million people in this country right now are struggling to pay their bills for daily essentials, for food, for eating, for the rent, for the mortgage, etc. That's unacceptable in a country that is so rich. It's absolutely unacceptable. Um, so I'm going to sort of leave it there. Um, but the format of this will be is we will introduce um, our amazing set of speakers who will get up to three minutes each. Aside from our poets, who, who we've got two tonight, two amazing poets and spoken word artists, we'll get up to five minutes. Um, then at the end, well, as you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A tab as well. If you've got any questions as the watching audience you want us to try and answer for you, just shove them in that box. And at the end, um, we will um, basically try and answer as many of those after um, all our speakers have had the chance to speak. Um, so, yeah, so without um, further ado, I will pass on Amy to introduce our first amazing speaker. Thanks, Richard. I realise now I was only supposed to say, hi, I'm Amy from Greater Manchester Money Advice Group, but I launched into it, never mind. Um, so let me introduce you to... Uh, Dada Zubeda, who is a polyglot, polyglot, I knew I'd stumble with that, polyglot poet, activist, champion progression 15 years through creative workshops. She's empowering women, 
youth in underprivileged communities. She's fluent in four languages. Um, she relates across different cultures. She's experienced struggles worldwide, igniting passion for freedom, speech, expression, escaping debt, injustice, societal limitations. And she's given a voice to the marginalized through artistic liberation. I've already heard her speak once. and She's absolutely brilliant. So over to you, Dada. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me all right? Awesome. Great stuff. So as Amy and Richard said, my name is Dada. I'm a mother of two and I love everything to do with art. Yes, like Dada, the art movement um, over 100 years ago that challenged literally pressing matters in a satire manner. And I like that style. So I've written a little piece for you guys. I hope it resonates with you. I hope at any moment in time you can feel or see or see somebody um, in this and understand the severity of the matter that we hear today. So oftentimes when we meet, chat and laugh, we tend to keep things surface level, never really going in depth. But since we're here pulling at the roots so we can replant in fresh soil, let me share with you my truth and how we got here in debt. There's 20 stories where, well, some may have shared a meal. Don't worry, most of us haven't yet. You see, the goal is for all of us to live above the breadline comfortably, feeding our families daily two, three times, but that's not the case. Life seems like a movie sometimes or a game when you're expecting to fall down wondering where's the catch when we're the race. Human with exquisite minds and power at hands at shifting at speed of the light. Who, man, can surely revolutionize for the better and set the pace. Many families like mine simply want to put food on the table daily, that's fine. Dining on pennies is just a route we take to avoid feeding in crime. So we go to the food bank where the best by date is merely a test by taste. You actually learn to get really savvy with the recipes and minimal resources. You see it as, some people may see it as, wow, you're so creative. In reality, you know we were left with no choices. Credit card saved the day when the money finished at the month's start. I went to bed with a full heart, woke up realizing, oh, repayments of these CCs will be quite hard on a part-time payslip or universal credit. Not sure how this will end. Still, I can't figure out the beginning. Feels like I'm begging for the bare necessities, stripped of my dignity to ensure my kids clothes fit. I got the uniform for their size. Gosh, I didn't realize how fast the kids were growing. I can't exactly ask them to stop just because the numbers in my bank accounts aren't showing. Having to pick between a bill or a meal. I can't lie, sometimes I just turn a blind eye. It's all too overwhelming, the storm is rough. Maybe if I put it away, the numbers and letters on that letter will hopefully fade away and I'll wake up to save the day as this was all just a bad dream. Wake up, this is real life, tough. Knock, knock. Where do I hide from this giant man at my door? Almost seems like a shadow floating, and although my feet are planted deep, I can't seem to feel the floor. No, serious question though. Like, why are they all so big standing in the doorframe? Sir, madam, is this your name? Unable to keep up with the bill for water because she decided it was necessary to feed her daughter. For that to be a choice to make seems like a sad scene for the human race. The daily hustle and bustle that we embrace was supposed to keep a roof over our family heads when we see rain. Broken down homes, where are the pillars? Leaders want our votes, what do they bring us? Keeping up with the Joneses is just not an option, my child. So we shop where we shop. If it rips, we stitch it up. When it breaks, where's the glue or where's the tape? Because essentially everything that's natural for us isn't in its natural state. And eventually everything that happens to us doesn't define our name. And the layers that we constantly have to peel back just to get a helping hand shouldn't feel like this excruciating pain, like nails in my pants. So let's figure out how we can put 100% to help over 10 million families like friends to overcome this burdensome way of living. Engulfed in shame and shivers, as today we witness the weaving of the greatest Britain. Thank you. 
And uh, that was absolutely um, stunning. I just think that line near the end um, where you talked about um, treating 10 million people like friends, I just think that's a really, really nice way of looking at it. But thank you so much for your time and effort you put in. We really appreciate it. I'm sure everybody listening to that did as well. Um, without further ado, um, I'll introduce our next speaker, very brilliant Ellen Rowlands, who co-leads the Disability Public Campaign Group for Inclusion London, um, who campaigns for equality for deaf and disabled people, and is a former director of the Greater Manchester Coalition of Disabled People. Ellen campaigns to end the injustice of social care charging on the Associated Local Authority Debt Recovery Practices. Ellen, over to you. Thanks today. Thanks, Richard. Um, so, hi everyone. I'm I'm Helen, and as Richard said, I'm one of the co-leads of the Disability Poverty Campaign Group, um, convened by Inclusion London, who I work for, and Disability Rights UK. So, Inclusion London support around eighty disabled people-led organisations, ma mainly in the Greater London area, but also nationally. And through the DPCG, we're raising awareness of the impacts of poverty on disabled people in their households. And um, what I'm focusing on particularly is campaigning for social care to be provided on NHS terms and for an end to care charging. Because we know that the charges are creating debt and distress that uh, at a minimum tens of thousands of disabled people with social care and support needs. So on the path to ending care charging for all, we're working to bring about some immediate changes that we think will lessen the harms of the existing uh, system. So here's some examples of the scale of the problem that, that, that we're trying to address. So between 2021 and the beginning of this year, 2,969 residents were subject to debt recovery actions by Stockport Council uh for their home care arrears durham county council up in the northeast uh they they took debt recovery action against 9929 residents who are in home care charge arrears sheffield city council uh took over 4000 debt recovery actions for for home care arrears and then down in the south, it's not just a north of England problem, down in the south, Bristol City Council uh, took 2,258, um, uh, took, took debt recovery actions against 2,258 residents. So we're talking about people who, who, who are disabled people uh, who are facing a disproportionate um, uh, impact from the cost of living crisis and uh, inadequate welfare and whose uh, health and well-being, which is supposed, supposed to be upheld by local authorities, we believe has been significantly undermined by uh, the stress of having to deal with, with, with these, with these um, social care debt recovery uh, procedures. So the main concerns that we have are that, that the number of people that are, are in arrears uh, for their social care is very, very high. Um, we're worried, as I said, about the impact of the debt recovery on people's health and well-being. Uh, we're worried about the growing evidence that disabled people are reducing and even ending their care package because they're in arrears and because they're faced with the debt recovery. Uh, we're very concerned that some councils are still using uh, civil enforcement agencies, bailiffs, to recover care charges. We want to see that ending. Um, we're working to raise awareness of the shortage of properly accessible and independent financial and debt advice for disabled people. We urgently need that to improve. Um, and finally, um, I've uncovered some evidence that, that, that some council assessment officers are lobbying to get stronger powers of debt recovery um, for local councils, and they want the DWP uh, to start making automated de deductions of care charges from disabled people's benefit income, and we're fighting very hard to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, so thanks to Debt Justice, to, to Richard and Ames for, for their, all their support. And uh, Ames has been absolutely amazing for a long time in supporting us on this, in highlighting the injustice of social care charging. And please let us know if you or anyone you know is affected uh, by social care debt. 
Fantastic. Helen, thank you so much. Um, you work so hard for this. So <laughs> we're all behind you and hoping we get the right results with this. You've just got to keep keep at it. Um, so um, I don't think we've got Louisa um, who was going to be next. So shall I move on to our Alice? I'm going to take that resounding silence. Yes. So, um, <laughs> so we're missing a speaker, but never fail. We'll we'll go on to uh, R. Alice, who uh, works as a in Cornwall, and she's been doing that since 2009. She she says she's living in a crumbling mortgage property with the fix due to end. I'm with you there, Alice. Um, and credit card debt's increasing since the cost of living issues began. And she's trying to take her own debt advice, which I'm sure is absolutely excellent. So I'm going to hand over. Alice is a regular at the uh, Greater Manchester Money Advice Group as well, even though she's from Cornwall. Over to you, Alice. Thanks, Amy. I'm going to risk putting my camera on, even though I think I've got a bit of a dodgy internet connection. So if it starts wobbling a bit, maybe someone let me know. Um, and the other thing, hmm, it's very blurry. Um, the other thing is uh, if you can hear me or not because of the unstable internet connection. So hopefully you can hear me. Um, I can hear you fine, Alice. Yeah, brilliant. Now, I don't know whether this is going to take one minute or whether it might take five, but I'm going to do my best to make it three. So, yeah, as Amy said, I work as a debt advisor and supervisor across two debt projects in Cornwall. One of them is a, a, a veterans project. So, like Amy, I was annoyed about Johnny Mercer and his comments about veterans. Um, so, so, for me, since the cost of living crisis started in was well, around 2022 wasn't it a couple of things have happened that made my financial situation worse so first of all there was the disruption of the interest uh, and mortgage rates so when my mortgage fix comes to an end next month I'll, I know I'll be paying more I don't know what it will be and I'm too scared to phone up and find out so you know it kind of brings it home to me how scary debt and money can be because even I don't want to phone up and you know have to go through the numbers and oh god you know it's going to be this or it's going to be that so that's one thing also I had a balance transfer credit card that I had for dealing with an old credit card debt that was like left over from Christmas a few years ago and since cost of living and all the food prices going up, I found that I had to use that card for spending, whereas I would never have had to before. So everyday spending, I'm putting on the card, it's running up interest, um, and I'm, I'm, I find that I'm relying on it for a lot of everyday stuff. And it so the balance is going up and it feels like, oh gosh, you know, I know that at some point, inevitably, things are going to start going wrong. But I'm a debt advisor, so I know what I can do about it if it does go wrong. I know what I would advise to myself if I was a client. So I would draw up a budget. And if there was some money left over on the card, I would say, you know, you can do a token offer plan or something like that. Trouble is that that's scary as well, because it means defaults on your credit. So that's, you know, it's not necessarily straightforward when you're faced with it yourself. Um, or I might advise another 0% balance transfer. Again, you know, I struggle with applying for these things because I honestly do not really want to have to do it. And I'm, I'm making that illustration so that it's clear that even someone who deals with debt every day is going to struggle with debt issues. So if I'm struggling with it, how how do how do average people with no, no debt knowledge feel when they're in debt? And I feel that it must be incredibly, incredibly worrying. And I know that obviously, like I said, I'm lucky. Um so in Cornwall, we had a report out recently that shows that 
40,000 people out of 572,000 are in a negative budget. So these are people in Cornwall, so where I work, that that cannot cover their basic outgoings, let alone paying their debts. When I started in 2009, there was always a little bit of money to squeeze out of people's budgets for making token offers. Now we're looking at people in negative budgets of like £300, £400 a month. It is it's not sustainable there's very little that debt advisors can do beyond things like bankruptcies and stuff like that that we might be able to clear the debts but it's not really a sustainable solution because when there isn't enough money to actually pay for the essentials the debts just pop back up again later on and the clients come back so what i want from the government is enough funding to to pay for adequate debt advice across the country, free adequate debt advice. Because if we as free debt advisors can't manage demand, you can be absolutely sure that there will be people out there, fee charging debt advisors who will find clients out there looking for free debt advice and they will charge them for it. And that causes a lot of problems as as Amy and uh, Richard will will be able to tell you. also, I would ask the government for changes. It has been like almost like an ideological change, I think. So wages haven't grown, benefits haven't increased, we've got the benefits cap, we've got the two-child limit on universal credit and child tax credit, we've got the bedroom tax. It's an ideology to squeeze the poorest people in society. It needs to change. So that would be my ask, and it would effectively be you know a fair taxation and work system fair benefit system fair wages money for debt advice when people get into debt and i'm sure i've probably have i gone over my three minutes yeah but it was powerful (laughs) so that's fine alice (laughs) okay that's fine i will end it there then and i won't i won't say well i will say that, you know, when they talk about taxing poor people uh, versus taxing rich people and they say, well, rich people won't hang around in the country, you know, if they're asked to pay fair tax. Well, I just think, well, no, A, they won't. And B, if they really want to go, then let them. So anyway, rant over. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Alice. And I, and I think actually a lot of what you said there fits in with one of the key demands in the people's manifesto which is very much about fair debt solutions so everyone can have a fresh start so i think that what you said will resonate with a lot of people so thank you for that alice i'm going to introduce our next brilliant speaker it's a lineup of brilliant speakers tonight isn't it we're very very blessed so um all the way from glasgow down to cornwall tonight so uh, you're all in for a big treat um as you've already started to hear so yeah i'm going to introduce now dean Byrne. Um, Dean is one of Debt Justice's longest serving Together Again Step Group members and is based in Greater Manchester. Dean played a key role in the production of the Together Again Step Manifesto and alongside Joe um, and Lisa in our groups has recently appeared in a Channel 4 feature on the cost of living crisis. Dean, over to you. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Good evening, everyone. Um, in talking about debt, um, my debt really goes back um, a very long time, 24 years. And at first it started off as simple payment plans, but due to the housing market changes, uh, we ended up moving into private rented accommodation in heavily another part of Stockport. After 13 years, a third property landlord owner, Savills, um, increased the rents uh, even further. Uh, This brought about a marriage breakdown, a split up, my savings were gone, mental health affected and uh, led to loss of of jobs. Uh, I was incapable of working. Um, I've already worked 41 years, 35 in office based. And I eventually moved after two years struggling on my own to move into Cheadle where I am now. And I've been here for the last 18 months I I have received some good support, but during the time, just as before I transitioned over to Cheadle, I did um, about about nearly um, over two years ago now, I joined Debt Justice 
and it's gone from there really but i'm still struggling i'm still struggling but the other part I want to cover about, about this, uh, it's not just about me personally. I want to also try and touch on uh, what about other people, um, uh, how other people are struggling in the UK as we lead up to the general election. And, of course, what are the political parties saying? Well, they're talking about changes and prosperity. And, yes, there are contentious and controversial issues to look at. But there needs to be, there needs to be, an immediate imminent review on debt at the top of their agendas besides the NHS and various other topics that they are dealing with. Let's just look at this. Let's look at the rent increase, mortgage fluctuations, interest fluctuations, uh, service management fee increases. It's not just simply because of the response I received from one my own from one of my prospective MPs just about building more social homes. It's also looking at, at second class home ownership as well within that particular industry. And it also covers other areas as what's been touched on already, energy price increases, council tax increases, bailiff's fees, eviction increases, large organisational, on the other side, excessive excessive profits we need to reduce debt now all these parties make pledges promises commitments although i haven't seen much mentioned on debt within their manifest manifestos but whoever wins this is a message to all the parties your words need to be put into action you need to listen to the people because after the general election Debt justice, we're working with all these various other organisations, community groups, uh, and the people of and the people, of course, will again be continuing, continuing rigorously to campaign against debt. That better, improved solutions must now be found and addressed from all the parties. If you want to change and bring prosper prosperity back right across the UK. I do feel that's what's really needed now. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much for that, Dean. Um, it's always a pleasure to, to hear you. Um, and we've heard you a few, I've heard you a few times now and every time it's a pleasure. I'm championing the work you're doing for debt justice as well. It's brilliant. Um, it's now uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Piers Telemark. Now, Piers is a Bradford community activist, um, currently working at the Race Equality Network, and he's been involved in a number of campaigns that include racial justice, the environment and sustainability and education. So really looking forward to hearing from you, Piers. Over to you. Hi, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, I just want to start by saying that the scale of the debt that people are facing, I don't think really, anybody can get a true handle on it because of the sensitivity of the issue and people are frankly embarrassed about it. People don't really spot, speak about the struggles and exactly what they're going through. But we have to remember, remember 14 years ago when we had all these cuts and all this austerity and it was about, it was telling us that we had to do this to bring down the deficit. And government told us how important it was that we sort of cleared the bank balance. And after 14 years of cuts and devastations to communities and to this country, the deficit hasn't even been brought down. But if the government can put an onus on bringing down the deficit for a country, then why can't it do the same for its own people? We had a situation not so long ago where we had massive spike in energy fees and costs and our government had a simple decision. Protect and safeguard the people from rising energy costs or protect and safeguard the big oil companies and allow them to make tremendous amounts of profit. And our government at the time chose to protect and defend the oil companies. So whilst millions of people are facing debt, energy debt, we've got companies and execs from oil companies experienced the highest levels of profits that they've ever experienced. And this was all a political choice. This was all a choice by our government, choosing to side with the rich and the powerful and to leave the poor and the vulnerable to fend for themselves. 
and I'm hoping, my hope, and I've got little hope with the Labour Party right now, but my hope is that they come to the defence of the people in this country and that we're asking for a fairer, more equitable society to distribute the wealth, to even it out. We've got crazy levels of inequality not seen since Victorian times where the gap between the rich and the poor is truly significant. And the only way that we can sort of even that gap is by a fair taxation um, system. And like the lady said at the beginning when I talked about the, the constant mantra you hear is, oh, well, if we put tax too high, then the rich people will leave. Well, the reality is I've already registered all the stuff in other countries to allow them to exploit these tax loopholes. So let them leave. Because I guarantee that that's just an empty threat and they will not go. They will not go. And we need to stop falling for this nonsense. We need to hold politicians to account and we need to demand a fair and more just society. So I applaud the work that you guys are doing and yourself, Richard. And we need everybody in this meeting to go out and spread the word and and sort of raise the profile of debt justice because as a nation, the levels of debt that people are experiencing individually, it's just not sustainable. And we need some kind of government intervention. We need better financial regulation. We need to ensure that we can't have predatory financial companies taking the absolute mick out of vulnerable people. So thanks everyone for joining and continue to support the work at Jet Justice. Thank you very much, um, Piers. Powerful as always. And I think, well, I took many things from that, but one thing, the rallying call you had there at the end was the importance of solidarity and coming together. And despite things being difficult, there is hope in solidarity, there is hope in getting action, there is hope in getting change when people who are experiencing the issues are campaigning and organising against them. So thank you. Um, without further ado, I'm going to go on to our... Next amazing speaker, um, um, Kirsty Taylor. Um, Kirsty Taylor is a writer and educator inspired by her beloved hometown of Bradford. She's passionate about storytelling through poetry and has performed all over the country, telling tales about people, class, and the realities of broken Britain. Her first full length play, Cashy Sees the Musical, is a unique rap and bassline show about poverty and austerity sold out uh, oh sorry about poverty and austerity and it sold out all of its shows in under 24 hours and received five star reviews and was voted in the guardian media's favorite stage shows of 2022 um, well done lass um <laughs> Kirstie taylor over to you yes thanks richard and yeah thanks to all the speakers um that are sharing like i'm inspired but very enraged by it all too and yeah hoping next week we'll bring about some change um i'm gonna share a couple of poems and the first one is about rage um and it's called only the rage will keep us warm and it goes like this only the rage can keep you warm and the breadline babies will know they're born into food bank queues and council cribs, first-hand poverty and second-hand bibs, third-world problems, four-way dibs, so far removed when they tell us it's only 20 quid, another Tory atrocity in our midst, they say forget the poor, and we say tax the rich. Only the rage can keep you warm when the meter's empty and the heating's gone, and the dads are guilty and the mothers are grafting and the kids are starving and the Tories are laughing. Too many years with no wage increase, benefit scroungers doing 50 hour weeks, Brexit prices privatise, Labour's silence and Tory lies. Only the rage can keep you warm as the services are cut and ripped and worn and you'll think it's your fault that you're brought up poor, just work harder as inflation soars and the rich are getting richer and the poor are doing what? Dying to make ends meet, labelled lazy when you're not, and they'll build this divide while hiding the disparity, so even your own will tell you life ain't no charity. Only the rage will keep us warm as we're clapping on a step for a service that's gone, and we're not allowed to strike, and we're not allowed to protest, and we're not getting paid, and the mechanisms feel hopeless. The NHS is broken, and there's lives at risk, and they're blaming immigration to fuel the racists. It's just culture wars disguised as politics. They say forget the poor, and we say tax the rich. 
Only the rage can keep you warm as we all collect crumbs off the kitchen floor and they tell you all to budget or something patronising and you'll risk it all because everything is rising. The cost of living, the cost of breathing, but they've got no clue because they all went to eat and we'll have no to rub together but our fists slash the cost of living, rushing not our wrists. You're making it impossible for people to exist, to simply survive, never mind to live. You say forget the poor and I say tax the rich. You say forget the poor, and we say tax the rich. Thank you. And then I'm going to share another one. Um, it feels like ages ago where um, it was not T-shirt weather. Um, I know some people on here are going to talk about uh, fuel poverty uh, and just winter and how difficult winter has become for lots of people. Um, so this one's called Warm Spaces. Warm space, full cups, hot water bottles tucked up under jumpers and dressing gowns in middle of day, foil on radiators, at least that's what they say. Yeah, that's what they say. Two pairs of socks and leggings under jeans, hands outstretched to old TV screens. Babies snuggled up with their teddies in bed. We'll do all as long as they're fed. We'll do all, won't we? As long as they're fed. Heating goes off when they're finally dropped off. Night shifts outside, too tired to clock off. Damp walls inside, you ignore the cough. Ignore the cough. 27 in queue for doctors, no appointments, you keep waiting. Next in queue, they keep saying. So you catch your patients and cuddle it, snatch your illness and smother it. Keep it to your send, keep it private for now, because we'll all have no left when NHS goes down. A borrowed tenor and a lent ear. 2024 and we're all living in fear. 2024 in the house of disparity. 2024 in the house of charity. 2024 in the house where you can see cold on your breath. Hungry and malnourished, literally sick to death. Paying tax for a service that relies on goodwill. Surviving being murdered by your heating bill. So try stay warm and walk fast. But don't forget to look when they all walk past. One in five people being broken by Britain. One in five people just hoping for something. One in five people with poverty panic on their faces. One in five people deserving more, but desperately looking for warm spaces. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, Kirsty. That was amazing. I wish we could have applause on this, but we can't. So that's my representative applause for you. Absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm just going to pause for a sec before I introduce the next person just to say if you've got any questions or comments or thoughts or even if while you're listening to these amazing speakers you, you're sort of inspired to have your own demand, you know, what you want to see the government that, that eventually comes in next week, what you want from them, please do put it in the, um, the Q&A or the chat because th these are the things that will we'll be drawing from um, afterwards. So thank you again to Kirsty. And um, I'm now going to introduce our next speaker, who is Rona Proudfoot. Um, and she is a community chef and a local organiser and activist all the way from Glasgow. She is currently pr um, providing summer meals to children who would usually be fed in school as Scottish schools break up uh, this week. So she's she's also doing cooking lessons with vulnerable families in conjunction with Queen's Park Football Club. Very, very busy lady. So as the local lead organiser with Fuel Poverty Action Glasgow, um, she's chairing meetings with the local hub, devising direct action events. She establishes collaborative work with other groups and agencies related to their mission of campaigning to protect people from fuel poverty and for clean and affordable energy production. So over to you, Rona. Hi, everyone. Just a quick word to say thank you to all the speakers that have preceded me because, and I should have maybe asked to not go after Kirsty because Richard knows that I'm a greeter and you were really moving. So thank you for, thank you for your words. That was, that was really nice. Um, so I, I'm really sorry. I didn't have time to prepare that. As you said, I'm doing two jobs right now and I've literally flew home to get online tonight. So I'm going to talk off the cuff. So forgive me if I stumble. Um, so a wee bit about my background, obviously, um, thank you to Amy for the intro there, that covered quite a bit of it, um, and I sound really, really busy, but um, my situation kind of spiralled by a calamity 
of catastrophes of being made redundant, illness, um, and I've been forced through a sequestration process, which is so unfair. Um, I don't know if the laws here in Scotland are, are completely different to what happens in England, but my actual debt is about five grand, but the sequestration process wants 60 grand off me, which means they're taking my flat off me. And it's, it, and for nothing, you know, the, these these people haven't contacted me for years, um, especially during the, the pandemic, it kind of went away and I managed to try to get on top of things. I managed to get a job, but then I got made redundant again. Um, And it's been brutal. I'm 46 and being a 46 woman, year old woman in the job market at the moment has been absolutely brutal. Um, I've been told to dumb down my CV. So all my years of experience are, mean nothing. Um, I've been told that they don't have budget for me, as in they want to pay me a junior salary, a starter salary. Um, so again, my experience and everything that I've done means nothing. It's been absolutely brutal. So I've had to adapt and I've retrained and I have a, a lifelong interest in food um, and cooking. I had a street food business um, and I, I've turned myself into a community cook. <laughs> so that's that. Um, so I'm, I am obviously working in areas that I'm really passionate about. And just like some of the speakers that have preceded me, I am really want to think the words for somebody used to stick it to the man. Um, I'm absolutely livid with what's going on. As somebody mentioned, we, when we delivered the manifesto to Westminster two months ago, last month, can't remember, um, there's money for banks, there's money for corporations. If you're a company and you go bankrupt, it's wiped, you know, uh, people are, it's it's insane that an individual um, is not only absolutely overwhelmed with more, like, as I say, my original debt is five grand, but the debt that they're now imposing on me is is completely life-changing. Um, it's, it's absolutely wild and I don't know where to go and I don't know what to do. Um, it's very, very scary. And, you know, as other speakers have, have mentioned, you, it is, it's frightening to, to approach the subject. And I know that the best, I know that the advice that everyone gives is to meet it head on, but meeting it head on is almost like admitting defeat in a way that I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to just accept all of this rather than having somebody who's going to fight my corner for me. Not being able to afford a lawyer is, a, again, and again, having a lawyer that, is basically you know useless in a lot of ways or charging you for things like I got a, I got a, a bill through my lawyer and 28 pounds they charged me for phoning me and I couldn't answer my phone at the time but they charged me 28 pounds for that things like that wild absolutely wild these so I think that what needs to happen as Dean said as other speakers have said as Pierce said there needs to be some kind of immediate legislation to stop us falling into more debt we've just come out of a two-year pandemic it, you know, what do they expect to happen? It, 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 is the, the dream of the Tory workhouse supposed to become a reality? You know, what, what is the agenda here? Um, and the archaic legal language that they'll use on this document is scary for somebody whose first language is English, you know, um, doing things, acting on behalf of the king, you know, these bailiffs, that's what they're, it's really, really frightening. And um, yeah, as I said, the, the fact that we're living in this financialization of capitalism just now, and it's it's wild. And if if you you know if I was a if I was a limited company, I would probably be walking away and maybe start another one next week, and it would be fine, you know. But wiping the slate clean as an individual is what the Amy Amy's doing, and and it's it's really really difficult. Um, sorry, I forgot to set my timer, and I was pro I promised myself I would. So I don't know if I'm wittering on, but yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm here for the fight, and I'm here to contribute as much as I can. I'm really glad I didn't burst out in into tears telling you all of this because I'm a greeter. But um, yeah, I'm. I'm looking forward to seeing what happens next week and what will happen for individuals experiencing what I'm experiencing, and really working towards detaching this shame. That's that that's you know with the, their banking on us being this ashamed and not talking about it and suffering and people shouldn't have to suffer. Um, we'll never know the full extent of how much poverty and debt is claiming lives 
that would otherwise be doing great things and enjoying their lives being here and um, we'll never know that and I think that you know we need to start talking about that as well thank you wow thank you so much Rona that was really really powerful and um, I think it was Alice put in the chat that you know it's quite shocking to have five thousand pound of debt turn into sixty thousand. So that's that's interesting. What's what's happened there? Um, and I'm totally hearing what you're saying about the inequality. The way if you haven't got much, you're treated so much worse than the very rich, you know, crook <laughs> who basically can walk away and and just start again. And we're not afforded that same luxury. I'm going to have to say more about that later, but um. Yeah, we'll keep, we've got to keep fighting. And as you say, I'm really pleased to hear you say it about getting rid of that stigma and that shame. Because I don't think it's us that should be ashamed. I think it's the people in charge. Anyway, before I run on too long, um, it's now my very great pleasure to introduce, I think this is our final speaker. Um, last but by no means least. So this is Joe. Um, Joe is a survivor, a filmmaker, an artist, a mum to a very special boy. Uh, now, she says she's a bit Marmite. I completely disagree. I think <laughs> she's just lovely. Um, she's an anti-poverty activist and campaigner. And she was on Channel 4 a few days ago um, with her son, Harry, talking about the reality. And so without further ado, Hi everyone, can you hear me? Hi. Oh wow. Um, well, you're all pretty amazing. I took something from everybody um, and from what you said. Thanks everybody for coming as well. Pretty tough acts um, to follow, uh, but I'm just going to crack on really. Um, I generally try and talk about other people when it comes to sort of um, talking about my own poverty and my own situation. Um, but I'm just going to introduce myself and let you know a bit about me. Um, I'm Jo, 52-year-old mum of one, um, and I've been in debt for over half my life. At its peak, it was £40,000 with a mortgage, a young toddler, no income, and it was pretty bleak. Um, I grew up the same as Ames, uh, not really knowing that we weren't well off, but it, I got to secondary school and it became really apparent. Um, my mum's a solo parent as well. She eventually bought a house and that became my goal too. Um, but I left school um, and I left home at almost 16 and life was just not easy at times. Um, it was luck in the end and being in the right place at the right time that gave me a really big break and it changed my reality. Uh, back then I ended up with a great home, a career that I worked hard for and it was all the stuff of dreams. And then I went from traveling the world earning a great salary, to having a mortgage, becoming pregnant at 35, losing my job, and all that lavish lifestyle before, and when I thought I could afford debt, just right then I knew I couldn't really afford that debt. Um, <clears throat> 15 years later, it's still absolutely not true that I can afford that debt. And the lack of critical support pathways at times has stolen what was left of my peace after living in that horrible circumstance. Everybody's described it here. Um, I don't know what the figures are around people who are having to constantly renegotiate historical debt, but I do know that once you're in it, getting out of it is almost impossible. And 10 million of us know that. That's why I'm here. I'm here to say that there's 10 million people living with this huge burden. So why are the politicians not speaking about it? Why is it not on the agenda in the run-up to a general election? Why are there not pledges being made to help people whose essentials are costing them extra in interest because they have to buy food on a credit card? Where is the outrage? There are 10 million people in unmanageable debt. And when I thought about this, I wondered, is that why the politicians aren't talking about it? Because they don't want us to know how many of us there are. We're millions and together we are stronger. 
Let's get debt on the agenda. Let's get this situation on the agenda because people deserve a chance to thrive. It's not a secret that the collision of being in debt, the massive cost of living increases and life on a low income is a recipe for disaster. And we, we deserve better. We deserve more than silence. We need bold actions and we need to recognize the power that we hold us when we work together to change the story. So let's get it on the agenda and let's stop the silence because we can change the story. Thank you. Sure. Wow. Yes, amazing, absolutely brilliant and powerful and strong as ever. Um, and yeah, just thank you, Joe. Thank you to all the speakers for your words. And before we take a few comments and questions, I'm just going to do a very quick call to action. What we want you, the watching audience, to do, now you've heard all those 10 powerful stories from all our amazing speakers who have really opened up and, you know, themselves and, and try to tackle the stigma so many of them talked about and so many um, came up with so many solutions we can do something and we're going to post um, in the chat um, a link um, to an action we're taking and it's very very simple it's basically writing to all your parliamentary candidates before next week we'll put the link in um, Zach's just put it in there thank you Zach you click on that link and that takes you through to an action where you literally put your name in, put your postcode in, and it will send you, um, send all the parliamentary candidates for your area um, a, a letter with our demands um, around taking action on debt. And those demands, I'm just going to read them out. The fair debt solution so everyone can have a fresh start, to be treated with dignity and protected from exploitation exploitation and harassment by creditors, debt collectors and bailiffs and an end to people being pushed into debt just to pay for the essentials like food, energy and housing they need. So what I'm asking everybody again is that link, click on it if you can. Um, it'll take you less than 30 seconds and encourage your friends and your family to do it because the more pressure we put on, the more difference we're likely to make. And what we will do after after this, um, after the election, whoever wins next week, we will be demanding meetings with new MPs. We will demand in action. We will be setting up new organising um, campaigns. And we want all of you to get involved. And we will be sending an email out tomorrow with more details on that. So if you feel like you've missed anything, not to worry. Um, so thank you to all the speakers. I'm just going to um, ask um, Zach um, to... Um, um, come on and show your face if you're able to, Zach, and read a couple of the comments and questions out, and we'll direct some of those towards the um, panellists. Um, yeah, we'll probably take do this for about um, 15 minutes before we close. Zach, I think you're on mute. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. I can't, I can do the text for everyone else, just not myself. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, so yes, thank you so much, everyone. Um, it's been a really amazing, it's been really amazing to hear um, all of the comments and um, the stories. The questions I'll be reading out. So thankfully, I'm oh, sorry, I'm just getting them up right now. So our first question um let me just increase the font size um <laughs> we've had why does widows widowers financial support widowers financial support only go to people under pension age pensioners who lose a spouse can quickly get rid of debt um can get into debt sorry when their income is cut in half why are they penalized in this way which can plunge them into debt I'm going to put this, if that's okay, uh, maybe to Amy or Alice um, first, actually. So, Amy, do you want to have a go at that? Would, is that something you think you might be able to...? Well, the, the reason is, is because that's the government's choice. You know, that that that's 
what the policy says. So there are such things as bereavement support payments, but the number one criteria for being eligible is that you're under state pension age. So what is the assumption there is that I suppose if you're over state pension age, you must be well off, which is obviously wrong. You know, we, we know that for a fact. So I can't give you a reason why other than that's the choice they make. And maybe there's a legacy expectation that, you know, by the time we get to a certain age, we all have assets and we all are, own our own properties and we're all living the life. And that's very outdated. You know, for a start, I think it's lucky if we get to pension age these days. I feel like it's. I'm going to be very lucky if I can draw a state pension, not die first, which I sort of feel like is the intention. So, um, so I think it's a uh, it's political choice, and and I can't really add more to it than that. There isn't an alternative that I know of, um, other than struggling, claiming pension credit, maybe trying to get help with with really awful things like funeral costs, but that's not living, is it? That's just patching over things. Alice, I don't know if you would add anything to that. Not really, except that if you think that there's an issue there and you haven't taken benefits advice, then I would take it just in case something has been missed. Um, there's many, many different types of bereavement and and widows pensions and support payments and things like that and i'm not a benefits advisor but if i was ever in doubt of what i could claim i would go and take benefits advice and it does seem to be that if there is there's a benefit there for someone who's under pension age but it isn't there for someone over pension age that can look like discrimination but there's a lot of benefits in the benefit system that do exactly that and it, it's it, it we we wouldn't uh, so amy and i would never dream of trying to justify it because it just doesn't seem fair um it, so that that's all i can add take take some advice is what i would do just in case you've been told you can't claim one thing but there might be something else out there you could claim instead zach um do you want to read out that comment about debt being built into the welfare system? Because I thought that was quite powerful. And I think in case people missed it, I think people might be interested to hear that. Yes, absolutely. Um, let's have a read. This is from um, Matt Vaughan Wilson. Thank you for um, adding this reflection. Um, debt is now more or less built into the welfare system. Let's put the window here. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> Debt is now more or less built into the welfare system. Five weeks wait for universal credit, so most people start out with an advance loan they have to repay, pushing an already low income below subsistence level. Feels like a control tactic. Thank you so much for um, that reflection, Matt. Thank you. Um... Matt, I'm just um before we start finishing, I'm gonna bring a few more of our panelists um back in in case I've got any other reflections based on what each other has said um um before me and Amy sort of round things up. So do any of our wonderful panelists have have you got anything um else to say? I know I'm not gonna be able to stop you because you're all powerful speakers. So who wants to um Go first. Anybody got anything before? Oh, we've got Jo. Jo, she got in there first. Go for it, Jo. <laughs> um, I, I just um, really felt that Piers' reflection, I think a couple of other people said it as well, that, um, that the idea that things can be wiped out for large, large organisations and that we're being tricked into believing that we're the problem and if it's possible to do something like for, like the government made a choice when it came to the energy crisis and they made a choice to support big oil companies. And I just think that that's maybe worth a little bit of talk because I think what happens in our society is that there's this horrendous system 
and we're constantly pushed to the bottom of it. Our kids are constantly pushed to the bottom of it. How can we like rise up against that? Joe, I was about to say, um, I think uh, J.F. Kennedy once said, um, it's not what the government does for you, it's what you should be doing for the government. But I think, personally, after what we've seen because of the extremism of what's happening now and has been happening for a number of years, even well before Brexit, I think that situation should be overturned the other way around. It's what they should be doing for the people rather than what we should be doing for whichever party. You know, they keep uh, pressing forward to try and uh, put the information across to us. It's our duty to support them, but it, it should be the other way around. That's the way I see it, more and more. Alice, very briefly, then we'll get everybody else coming. Yeah, I mean, I agree that there's it is an ideology that is out there, and there's also a massive misconception, I think, amongst the parties at the moment that it's still kind of current to be up on working people and you know denigrate trade unions and etc. Uh, etc. Et and what they're not realising is that the mood is changing because most people, many, many people, are either in a trade union or have been affected by low wages. So it's like they keep on trying to sort of point it as, you know, it's them doing it. It's it's those doctors going on strike that mean you can't have your NHS appointment. It's those uh, train operators going on strike that mean you can't get to work. And what they've not realised is because it's now so widespread it is so many of us that we now don't go, oh, yeah, those awful train operators or those awful junior doctors. We go, hang on a minute, that's me. Um, and it, they massively misread the mood. And I think this is the time to pick it up and go, this is us. This is what we think. Um, and yeah to say and stand up for you know I, don't, I hate that kind of like stand up for working people sort of thing because it's not just working people it's also people that can't work so it's also people on benefits that are relying on that system so you know we need to stand up for for all of those people um but yeah i think they've massively misread the mood and it's a mistake for them we can take advantage of it thank you thank you alice um Yes, have you got any sort of last words? Come on, Richard. You know I love having last word. <laughs> no, it's 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 you've got to frame it as in these are all choices. Like I said, two thousand and whenever it was well, two thousand and eight, when the bankers crashed the economy, they used our taxation to bail the bankers out, and that encouraged a climate of greed. If you're making sort of bets to try and make money to in, to try and get bonuses because you've done a good job but you know ultimately ultimately if your bet goes bad and goes seriously bad it's going to be covered then that is incentivizing greed and that's incentivizing this kind of capitalist society that we live in and it just sickens me that the government would intervene and bail out some of the richest people in society and yet we've got 10 million people living in absolute poverty and they can't even use our taxation. Because I think if you put this poll out to the public and said, right, this is the people's taxation, the people's money, would you rather bail out 10 million people and get everyone on a fresh start or bail out bankers? I think we all know what the answer to that question would be. And I think we really need to start breaking this down and communicating to people the sort of... The, the the scale of the money that the government can throw about. If you look at that, the Dame Moan, I forgot her name, the lady in House of Lords who 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 sorted a mate out with a two hundred million pound contract. She got a thirty million pound finders fee. The government didn't even make any attempts to chase up that money to try and recuperate that money to try and get it back. Two hundred million pound. I remember when I'm getting rid of EMA and I was campaigning to save it to give every kid in the country EMA costs. 500 million pounds and they told us we had no money for EMA yet they've got 200 million pounds to just throw away a contract and that was one of dozens of contracts of that size so we just really need to re re reiterate to people that these are choices we have plenty of money in the system we get taxed on absolutely everything don't just think about income tax don't just think about about um bloody tax on your houses it's tax on food it's tax on clothes it's tax on 
bloody period stuff. You get taxed on tampons. You get taxed on absolutely everything. And this is our money. And we need a fresh start in this country. And, and that's what I think should be the campaign, Richard. They need to be campaigning to get the government, to get everyone to a fresh start so we can have a thriving economy, hopefully once again. Thank you, Piers. Um, Amy, do you want to introduce a few other speakers? Um, yeah, sure. I'm going to have to change my view on my screen because I can't see everybody. I just wonder, um, Helen, if I can come to you. If you, Are you still with us, Helen? I can just see it. I can just see a H in a box. <laughs> are you still there? Possibly not. Okay, I'll come back to Helen if she's there. Could I ask Kirsty a question? Because I've not heard you speak before, Kirsty. And um, I just wondered what your backstory is. What what got you to that point where you know you you able to express it with your your poetry and you're able to express it with the the play that you own. Congratulations on that sell, selling out, by the way. But what was you know, when Joe was talking about like that, everything changed. Was that the same for you or was it a gradual? Yeah, I think um, I, I just, I'm passionate about people. And um, when I, yeah, I kind of got into this topic really in more depth when um, I started writing the play about uh, cash converters, about pawnbrokers and people who like rely on that service. And, you know, it were a service that stayed open during the pandemic because it were classed as an essential service. And, you know, while people rely on it for quick money, you know, it's also like uh, massively gets people into debt. And um, yeah, just, and I was just really interested in that, that stigma and like the self-esteem that comes with that, that, you know, people have spoke about and there's this focus on like individualism in, there in like terms of, um, you know, that, that blame on yourself and, and just that government response to it. And yeah, I just, just really wanted to like share them stories as well and put humans into those stories and humanize the people. And, you know, that it can, it, it happens to different people and, um, yeah, like my own family, my dad were um, a massive gambler and like, you know, my mum's lived in debt. Like my mum, she's only just kind of got a mortgage on an house. Like, and there's something about just that stability. Like, um, you know, I live in rented housing. Uh, I live, you know, I'm very privileged, like, um, and, but I, I don't ever see that I would own an house and even just your family not owning an house. Like it's that idea that things could go at any minute and, you know, I've been in the situation at a few points in my life, like my mum has, and um, yeah, I just think it's. I just feel passionate about telling them stories and and hearing them as well. I feel like really moved and like fucking angry about what I've heard tonight, and I just want yeah, I just want to keep putting putting that message out there, and um, hopefully it can change. It's. I heard a mad statistic last week just about the tax and billionaires like. Something like 160 billionaires literally could wipe everything for everyone else, couldn't they? Like it's such a small percentage of people could actually sort it out for everybody else. Um, so, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, and Rona, you've got your hand up there. Yeah, I just wanted to, to on the back of what Kirsty just said there about the billionaires being able to wipe the debt. We are about to experience this decade our first trillionaire. And how how can we even compute that kind of that kind of greed? You know, it's it's it, it, it that that could wipe everything. We could start again. You know, it would it, it's it, it's absolutely insanity that even that the, these billionaires will never live long enough to even make a dent in that. And it, it, you know, it, it there there has to be something done about that excess greed. Um, it's pathological profiteering. Nobody makes a trillion. Nobody makes a million. Nobody, you take it. You know, you're taking it. You're, you're, it's people's livelihoods. It's people's wages. It's super exploitation, hyper exploitation. Um, we can't live like this anymore. You know, it's it's inhumane. It really is. That was my, my tuppence there. Thank you for saying that, Kirsty. Thank you, Rona. Um, there's a lot here about it equality inequality isn't there which i'll probably say more about in a minute but um does does anybody else want to make a comment or or about anything that they've heard 
I'm, I'm just conscious there's, there's two people we've not asked to do rounding comments yet, um, Amy, before me and you. Um, obviously, Ellen, I think you alluded to, but I just wonder if Dada, you know, you started off Dada with that really powerful piece and reflection on society, how it is right now. Just based on everything you've heard from the other speakers too, what are you feeling right now and what would your actions be would you put to to government? Um, thank you so much for that. And thank you everyone for just showing us a different vantage point as well. Um, everyone who's experienced debt has their own, you know, it, it carries weight. It carries so much weight on your shoulders, whether it's pushing you down or it's weight on your feet that's literally dragging you down. So um, hearing from other people and how they got into that, that um, what you said there, Rona, from five to 60, like that's going to swirl in my head a whole night thinking, oh, th just the same way they can turn the five to 60. Like you said, with the statistic, um, they can they can wipe people's debt without feeling the dent themselves. So I think what I always end up landing on with these situations is, is, is again, looking at humanity and adding the human aspect to it and I think if people heard your stories more so more platform whether there is funding whether it's space whether it's stages provided for people to share their experiences and and but would be rewarded by something because I take it it's a lot when you open up and 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 expose your vulnerability it, it, it's a lot of weight on you so I commend every single one of you for being so um transparent but I, I urge everybody to make more noise, like bang with our feet, bang on the walls with our fists, like do what we have to do to let the world know that it's this is not okay and it shouldn't be normalized. Because I think like we're slipping into this normalization of the discomfort. It's like learning to live with a bit of ache in your back. You're like, oh, that's fine. It's been there for years. No, but this is not okay. Like let's let's straighten it out and get to the root and then actually start with things like education you know there's so many on so many levels these things can be attacked for the better and unless we keep banging we're just gonna keep fading in the background so thank you all for your time no thank you dada do you know i never know when you're doing the poetry and when you're just speaking because it all sounds like poetry to me the way you put the words together is amazing so thank you so much for that and um could I call on Dean for some some of your final thoughts based on what you've heard so far tonight? Yeah, it's all critically important, very important stuff. Um, some some thought that went through my mind before is that even from a government perspective, I think there was a couple of touches on the DWP. I think the initiatives there don't help people anyway to try and uh, try, try and get back into work. Uh, we do look at temporary work, but we also look at short-term contracts, low pay, um, terrible pay within the caring side when people can't work or they're looking after family members. So there's a whole array of stuff there that we've we've just literally just touched on the top of the on the top of the mountain, but there's a long way to go. And um my thoughts beyond that is uh, yes, uh, like Dada mentions, we just have to keep going and raise our voices even higher and get more people involved. Um, even after the election, you know, we have to go from strength to strength. That's my opinion. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Dean. Thank you. Um, has anybody else got any final comment? Has everybody had a chance to, to say something? Joe? I just wanna, um, Dada said something that really like impacted me because actually this is what kept me silent for a long time. Why are they always so big? When they stand in my doorway, why are they always so big? And I think that is what's going on, isn't it? It's like management by fear. These threats that people who are gonna get taxed, who have huge wealth, they're gonna leave the UK. What are they doing anyway? They're just bleeding us dry. You know, they make themselves big. Uh, we, we could be bigger. I, I think this comes down to um, where I started, really, which was talking about being a little bit different and kids picking on you in the, you know, in the classroom and in the playground because you look a bit different. I feel like there's there's 
this is like the big people picking on the little people and, and sort of hoping that they don't fight back. So that is that why so many PIP claims get rejected? Because the hope is, you know, they, they, these are ill people or these are disabled people who won't fight back. You know, we can just reject their their application and they'll, they'll just go away or they, they'll be too scared to appeal. Or the, you know, the, there's that fear in there that I feel like they, they play on. And, and nothing says this to me more as a debt advisor than when I'm with somebody who has tried to speak to a creditor, be it a bank, be it, I don't know, Lowell Financial, whoever it is, credit card company, and they'll ring them and say, listen, I really can't afford it. I'm skin. You know, this has happened, that has happened. And they, they won't listen to it from the person. The person has to go and see a debt advisor. The debt advisor rings up and says, you know, this person can't afford it. They go, all oh, right, right. Thanks for letting us know. You know, we'll do this and we'll do that. Just take it from the person who's speaking to you in the first place. You know, they know their situation, but it's almost as though there's... um. There's an unwillingness to to deal with with you, and I don't know why. Why would that be the case? Why was it that the cost of living crisis only became a crisis when it started affecting like the middle classes and and they start feeling the pinch a little bit? And maybe they're not shopping at Waitrose anymore. They might, they might have to go to Little, you know, <laughs> big shock. What when so many of us are just dealing with that? you know, week in and week out, but it became a problem when it started to affect that sort of person, the right sort of person, whatever it is. So I do feel like there's a lot of inequality going on, a lot of picking on people because because it's easy, because they're cowardly and because if you're not bunging the big political parties, you know, however many million uh, to for them to do things that that help you and your business out well I'm sort of not interested sort of not interested in that in the person who's just got the bailiffs at the door and and so on so but we've got voices here that are brilliant you know and speak really well and we've got to, we've got to make them louder get get more and make it louder and make it so we can't just be fobbed off you know and told to go and go and see a professional we we've got We've got the tools that we need here, actually. You know, we can all speak up. So, uh, sorry, waffling on there, Richard. <laughs> Shut me up. It, 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 it wasn't waffling. I'm like, I banging my table, you know. It's like, oh, that's all right then. Uh, but, yeah, but just sort of to wrap up from my point of view, just first of all, um, a thank you to all the audience who have come um, tonight. It's, it's really great that we've got people from across the country but also thank you to all our amazing um, um, panellists. Um, a massive thank you to Zach, uh, who has been keeping me sane on the tech front, and also to Amy, to you for your expertise, your insight and your support of debt justice. It's massively, massively appreciated. And just on that theme of us and what we can do going forward, you're all right with, with the risk power in Unity. And when I'm doing my community organising training, does I do this session on power. And if any of you not been to it, I'd invite you all. We'll do it sometime together. If anybody's interested, let me know. But I have a phrase because power's often used in a really negative context, like Dad had talked about, about the bailiff who's standing over you, about the awful government minister uh, who doesn't really care, um, about the newspaper journalist, whoever it might be who has what we might see as some negative form of power. But I don't see it like that. And I want to change your view on what power is. I think power is quite neutral. And I always say to people in our um, sort of training session, power is the ability to act. And we have all got that ability. You have taken a decision to come to this tonight so you've made a decision to act that you're, you know, you're sick of debt. All of you panellists have made a decision to say enough is enough. I'm going to start sharing and speaking my truth. And the next stage is, whoever that next government is, we are going to use our collective relational power to say we're not having this. And these 10 recommendations in this um, man people's manifesto on debt, we will campaign until we've won 
on every single one of them. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> Get an email from us very soon about follow-up actions. But you're amazing, and let's take it to the next government and let's win, because we will do. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Be in touch soon. Good night. Enjoy the football. Take care. Bye. <laughs> Yeah, best of luck to everybody in England with football. We are. <laughs> we need it. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Bye for now. Bye for now. Well, bye. 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 Bye.